Madam President, I've come down to the floor today to talk about the tax extenders package that the House is likely to vote on today. And unfortunately and sadly, it looks as though we've reached another low point in the world of dysfunctional Washington politics. The House will vote on what's being called a one-year retroactive extension of dozens of expired tax laws. This bill contains everything from research and development tax credit to the wind production tax credit to the new markets tax credit. And they've let us know that this is the best bill that they could cobble together over there. But in reality, this is not a one-year extension. It is a three-week extension of expired tax laws until the end of this year. Three weeks until the end of this year. On January 1st, all of our tax laws will expire again. No one in the real world would ever run an enterprise like this. It's bad enough that we do extenders for two years without making them permanent. But to come here and say the best we can do is a one-year extension, and to know that really it's only a three-week extension makes no sense at all. If the purpose of this bill is to encourage investments in business or our communities, how does a one-year retroactive bill make any sense at all? If the purpose of the bill is to provide greater certainty for families and for businesses, how does a one-year retroactive bill accomplish that? Only in this land of flickering lights of Washington, D.C., where we're barely keeping the government running, does it make sense? I thought we'd reached a new low two years ago when we voted on the so-called fiscal cliff deal, Madam President, when the Bush tax cuts were expiring and there was a bipartisan deal that was uh, uh, meant to avoid, among other things, avoid the sequester, passed at 2.30 in the morning here. And then 90 days later, the sequester went into effect, the very thing that we were supposed to be protecting against. That deal is somehow sometimes touted as a great act of bipartisanship. I think the only thing bipartisan about it was the confession that the two parties couldn't figure out how to actually get our fiscal house in order. Had we known that night that the sequester was going to go into effect 90 days before, had we known that night, there's no way there would have been 92 yes votes for the, that deal. There was no way it would have passed, and we're still living with it today. Coincidentally, the last time we passed tax extenders, it was part of that deal. In the fiscal cliff deal, we at least provided a two-year extension to these temporary tax laws. And here, it turns out that we're going to be lucky if we provide three weeks of certainty. And many of the people I represent say this bill is only marginally better than no bill at all, and they reasonably wonder why in the world we wouldn't just do another two-year extension. They prefer more certainty than that, to plan for their businesses, to plan in their communities. Instead of doing the short-term House bill, the Senate should instead take up the bipartisan bill that the Senate Finance Committee reported over six months ago. I always hear people in this body lament the lack of regular order, and I lament the lack of regular order. This bill represented a great attempt at regular order and got the votes of Republicans and Democrats on the Finance Committee. We had a markup. We voted on amendments. Some passed, some didn't. And then we voted the bill out to the Senate floor six months ago. The Ways and Means Committee in the House didn't hold a markup on, on the House bill that they're considering today. It's my understanding the House will be allowing few, if any, amendments. So why is that bill in any way preferable to the Senate bill where we did the work of legislating? And our two-year bill deserves a vote here on this floor. Among dozens of provisions that are important to families and businesses in Colorado and across the country, I wanted to highlight just two today. The first is the credit for wind energy. The wind PTC and ITC, the production tax credit and investment tax credit, have always enjoyed broad support from both sides of the aisle, ranging from its original co-sponsor, Senator Grassley from Iowa, to my friend and colleague from Colorado, Mark Udall, and I should say that nobody has been a greater champion for wind relentlessly over the years in the support of our wind industry in Colorado and those jobs, high-paying jobs in our state, than Mark Udall. 
if enacted into law, the Senate version of the PTC and ITC for WIND will, will continue to drive job growth in Colorado. And we're not talking about some fly-by-night experiment here. This isn't some Bolshevik takeover of uh, the United States. These are jobs, manufacturing jobs, and other high-paying jobs right here in the United States and, and, and right here in Colorado, where we have 5,000 people working in this industry. In Colorado, Vestas, which manufactures wind turbines, employs over 1,400 workers across four factories from Pueblo all the way up I-25 to Brighton and Windsor. And these aren't just manufacturing and design jobs near urban centers. It's also construction and operations jobs at the actual wind farms. I visited one in Peets, Colorado a couple of years ago. It was a little bit scary because we climbed up, I climbed up to the very top of the wind turbine and then I thought we were done. But then they opened a hatch in the top of this thing and they said, Senator, it's time to go out and see what this looks like, which I did standing on the top of this this wind turbine housing in, in the shoes that I wear on the floor of the Senate. Even though I was hooked up, it was a little bit scary. But the guy that took me there was telling me that he had been able to come back to his home community, a rural community in Colorado, and work in this high paying job just because the wind industry was there. It was something he never would have imagined when he was a kid. But now he's got real opportunity. There are thousands of people just like that all over my state that are concerned that the political conversation here has decoupled once again from their concerns and has become about the internal politics of Washington, D.C. and not what's actually going on in places like rural Colorado or in rural places all across the United States. This industry drives economic growth across our state from the conference rooms of, each, of tech startups in Boulder and Denver all the way to the 6,000-acre Kit Carson wind power generating site just west of the Kansas state line. The production tax credit has driven $105 billion in private investment, which is actually amazing when you think about it, given the fact that there has been so much uncertainty associated with it. $105 billion opened up 50, 550 industrial facilities and provided $180 million in lease payments to rural farmers to ranchers and to landowners who host wind farms. And the mention of those rural farmers and ranchers brings me to the second provision of the Expire Act that I wanted to highlight, Madam President, the tax incentive for conservation easements. Private land conservation is critical in states like Colorado. Healthy grasslands, open landscapes, and abundant wildlife are a fundamental part of what it is to be in the West, to be in Colorado. And in the 2014 Farm Bill, we worked really hard to build a strong conservation title, and the easement incentive in the Senate Finance Committee bill is an important complement to the work in the Farm Bill. This incentive accounts for the true value of conserved land, which allows family farmers, ranchers, and moderate income landowners to preserve land for our kids and for our grandkids to enjoy. In Colorado, we've got landowners lined up to take advantage of this very well design program. It opens up conservation options to the land rich, but people that might be cash poor, producers who feed this country. And this is land that we've got to keep in production. But when you're living in a place where the, the value isn't calculated properly and there's a high value associated with it and you don't have the money to be able to put it into easement, this program can help you do that. And if we do that, we get to hold on to our farms and ranches in our state. But here we are again, considering a bill that extends these benefits for only three weeks. If it's good policy for three weeks, why isn't it good policy for two years? If we pass the House bill, we're telling farmers and ranchers across states like Colorado that we don't value long-term conservation, that we don't take it seriously. The loss of this tax incentive would mean that less land across the West would be protected. Again, a voluntary program. This isn't telling anybody they have to do anything with their farm and their ranch. It's just an option for them if they want to use it. More wildlife habitat will be lost. Water quality will suffer. And Colorado's scenic beauty, which is critical to our way of life and to our economy, will be threatened. We passed the House bill. People's jobs across Colorado will be placed at risk. And this is due to Congress's failure to do its job. We can do better than this. We can do better than this. We really should, at this late hour, 
reconsider this and pass the Senate bill, pass the expiry, pass a bipartisan piece of legislation that came out of the Finance Committee through regular order six months ago. We've had plenty of time to consider that. And then we should come back and we should do comprehensive tax reform and give our country a tax code that's actually worthy of the entrepreneurs that are out there working every day to invent our future. The last time the tax code, this might be of interest to the pages that are here today, the last time the tax code was updated in this country, I was in college. I was in college. What are the chances that today's tax code reflects the American economy as it actually is? To say nothing of the global economy as it actually is. The chances are zero. This is the work that we've been sent here to do. It's hard, but that's what we're supposed to be doing here. And I hope in the new year, there's gonna be a big change around this place. And I hope all of us use that change to the advantage of the American people, you know, by putting ourselves back to work. They're working hard. The least we can do is work together to, to actually align our leg legislation and our regulation uh, to the world as it actually exists, rather than one that existed 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Madam President, I appreciate the chance to speak today on these important issues to Colorado, and with that, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum.